Good morning. Very nice to be with you all here today. Um, Ron Prin just told you something about how we go about estimating the costs of dealing uh, with climate change, with curtailing our emissions of greenhouse gases. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about how we use science, just a little bit, about how we use science essentially to estimate the cost to us if we don't do anything about it at all. So what are the actual uh, risks involved? This is a very large and fascinating subject, fascinating both from a scientific intellectual standpoint and from a social standpoint. I can only touch the surface of it here today. Uh, let me just start off with a very quick and not complete list of the, what we consider the risks and I should add benefits that we might experience. Uh, we've already talked a bit about increasing sea level. I'll, I'll fill in that a little bit today about what actually happens. Uh, increasing hydrological uh, extremes, I should say, droughts and floods, increasing incidence of high category hurricanes, which is my own field of research, and associated storm surges and freshwater flooding, more heat stress and other health risks. And uh, this doesn't get talked about nearly as much, in my opinion, as the destabilization of societies, armed conflict. It's far from my expertise, but I will quote some of the people who really are experts in this. And we have to be conscious that there are benefits. There are two sides of this ledger. For example, some increase in plant productivity and uh, obviously a reduction in the risks of health problems that are related to cold weather. Um, but as quoted from the last report of the IPCC, taken as a whole, uh, we think we're reasonably sure that if we don't do anything about this, it's going to, there are going to be very significant costs associated with it. Now, to kind of illustrate the problem, I want to show you this graph of the recovery of global sea level from the last uh, glacial period. So this goes from 24,000 years ago to about the present. Uh, at the peak of the last uh, ice age, sea level was about 130 meters, or roughly 400 feet lower than today. That's a lot. It recovered, and you can see that beginning about seven or 8,000 years ago has been remarkably stable, as has temperature CO2 content. It is not an accident that civilization developed largely during this period. Now, to give you an idea of the problem we face, in a nutshell, is that we have, in the course of our civilization, become extremely finely adapted to this climate. It, you know, you can ask the hypothetical question, wouldn't it be nicer if it were warmer or colder? That isn't the issue. The issue is the adaptation. So um, Sandy, that hit New York, um, flooded it, of course, lower Manhattan, with a local elevation of sea level which you could not detect on this graph. Okay, it was so tiny compared to what geology did. All right, it doesn't take a lot. All right, but we've built these big cities, including the one we're living in here now, a lot of them very close to sea level. It doesn't take much sea level change by historical standards to cause a lot of disruption. You know, our distant ancestors who were nomadic, who lived much uh, earlier than this, just moved without even necessarily being conscious of it. You can't easily move New York City. And that's kind of the rub of this problem. Um, so sea level is going up. These are based upon actual measurements, or, which are themselves getting uh, better and better with time at a rate of about 3.4 millimeters a year. If you just extrapolate that without accounting for any acceleration, you get a third of a meter by the end of the century, but we think it will likely, uh, in fact, accelerate, and we'll have to deal with more than that. Um, we can already start seeing uh, some problems with this. So if you look at, if you go talk to people in uh, Miami Beach, um, you see that it floods uh, rather commonly today, just at ordinary astronomical high tides. There's blue sky back here. This isn't a storm, all right? I went and talked to a bunch of uh, Tea Party people in Miami two years ago. There were no climate deniers among them, all right? That's right. So Tip O'Neill said that all politics is local. I say all climate is local. All right. um, this is a reconstruction of what our area would look like if we had a mere 1.5 meter storm surge 
So this is an important thing for you to understand. The surges are the canary in the mine. You have a gradual level of elevation of sea level. Even if the storms themselves don't change, um, you know, a relatively modest, say, hurricane-induced surge would overtop the Charles River Dam and might produce conditions like this, all right? And I would rather be sitting in the back of the auditorium than down here when this happens. Uh, heat. Uh, this is interesting. There's a high level of human adaptation to heat. Uh, we see even on a seasonal scale. But there's a limit to that, all right? So this is just a projection of temperature going up to the year 2100. Uh, this is the global temperature during a time when there was a fantastic heat wave in Europe that killed a lot of people. That becomes routine. It looks a little bit scary if you compare this to that, but you have to remember that we do adapt to temperature. On the other hand, there's a limit to that adaptation, and it's a physical, biological limit dictated by our body temperature. We can't live in a climate, at least without air conditioning, when something called the wet bulb temperature, which reflects both temperature and humidity, goes over about 35 degrees C. And as uh, Fatih uh, just showed you two talks ago, this is projected to start happening if we don't do anything in certain parts of the world, like the Persian Gulf, by the end of the century. You can't, if this happens, you can't go outside for a very long period, okay? So, you know, if you have real estate holdings in Dubai, this would be a good time to divest from those. <laughs> now, among the most serious consequences of climate change are one that we do not actually need huge climate models to tell us about. And it's just basic physics 101, climate physics 101. As you warm the climate, what happens to global mean rainfall is it goes up a little bit, not very much. The most significant thing is that the extremes change. The probability distribution of rainfall gets much broader. It may shift a little bit, but the really consequential thing it gets broader. And that means, ironically, that in general you expect to see more floods, and records are beginning to hint that we're seeing that. Uh, more drought, okay, and you've all uh, seen, I think, on the news anyway, what the consequences of that are. And um, so rainfall intensity actually scales with a basic thermodynamic proposition, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, roughly doubling for every 10 degrees C. Wet places get wetter in general, as a general rule. There are exceptions. Dry places get drier. The incidence of both floods and drought increases. And here is the rub, and that is that these changes have potentially large effects on food and water supplies, and through that, become a national security issue, as recognized by our own Defense Department. So here is a quotation from their Quadrennial Defense Review of 2010, and um, I'll let you read it yourself, but the people who, in the Defense Department, who study the history of warfare and migration understand very well that climate change, even small natural climate changes, have historically been big instigators of armed conflict and uh, big security issues. And frankly, when I read reports like this, of all the possible consequences of climate change, personally, it's the one that frightens me most, and it gets very little attention. Not zero, but comparatively little attention. And we've heard about the risks associated with ocean acidification, a direct effect of CO2 having nothing really to do with climate, per se, and um, those effects are potentially dangerous and just beginning to be understood. I work on hurricanes. Uh, I work on the physics of hurricanes. And there are some aspects of this that are straightforward, others not so. Uh, on the economic side, in, in the uh, United States, they dominate the um, monetary damage from hurricanes. This is an estimate of monetary damage by natural hazards in the US. Um, tropical cyclones, aka hurricanes, are this blue slice. Then you have drought and heat waves, severe thunderstorms, winter storms, and so forth. If you look at insured damage, uh, something like 80% of insured losses from natural disasters around the world are caused by windstorms. So this is something that we worry about. Uh, we see in actual satellite data interesting trends. Um, I've lost the time scale here, but this is roughly the last 30 years. This shows simply the satellite-derived latitude at which hurricanes peak 
at their intensity, this for the northern hemisphere, this for the southern hemisphere. In both hemispheres, the um, uh, peak intensity is being reached successively poleward. And this is actually something that we predicted theoretically and that we've also seen in climate models. So it's an interesting measure where all of those uh, line up pretty well. There are, we're still uncertain in projections of hurricanes going forward, but this is hurricane power projected over the next 100 years or so. This is uh, uh, sort of hindcast for the last part of the 20th century and going forward, rather substantial increases there. And we can translate that down on the local scale by um, uh, a rather uh, interesting technique of downscaling I don't have time to tell you about, but it involves generating thousands of synthetic hurricanes uh, driven by global climate models. And this shows the change in the return periods for peak uh, hurricane-induced storm surges in Boston Harbor. I thought I would do that for here, since we're here. Uh, the blue dots are for the current climate, the red dots for the end of the century if we don't do much about curbing carbon dioxide. This is return period. This is the peak surge level without any sea level rise, all right? So this is just storminess. And so you can see that a storm that uh, might have caused a 1,000-year surge drops down to something more like a 100-year surge. Uh, and that's just because of a change in the risk, largely due to this poleward migration of the latitude of peak intensity of storms. Now, if we add on to that a kind of uh, uh, a one-meter uh, sea level rise, a general sea level rise, then, of course, it becomes much more extreme and events that you essentially never see in the many, many thousands of years uh, occur every few centuries on this kind of analysis. Now, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty with this still, but this is the kind of risk analysis that we are trying to do so that we can hand these numbers over to economists and other experts to actually sort of try to cost out what what will society pay for climate change if we do nothing to compare to the sort of numbers that Ron Prynne showed you? Okay. And uh, we did this, in, uh, we did this uh, in a rather massive way for the case of many natural hazards uh, in a report that was commissioned by Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, and uh, we did this for many, many hazards. I was involved in the hurricane part of that hazard. And this shows the annual projected costs in billions of dollars uh, from hurricanes. This is, these are for the United States, I should say, uh, with and without accounting for sea level rise. So the, the, I should say the blue is for sea level rise alone. Green also takes into account changing hurricane climatology. This is. Uh, around 2030, 2050, and 2100. And you can see there's a range of estimates. How you estimate that uncertainty is itself a very interesting subject. But you can see that we could be paying $60 billion a year in hurricane damages in the US by the end of the century if we don't do anything. Now, you have to do that if you, to the best of your ability for all the uh, kinds of hazards associated with climate. So among the risks I'm considering now is the risk incurred by standing between you and lunch. So I'll summarize here. Um, and I want to make uh, two essential points here. Um, some of the risks of climate change are quantifiable in a probabilistic framework today. That is, we have gotten better not only in our knowledge of the climate system, but in exploring the frontiers of our ignorance, that is, in being able to quantify what we don't know or to the extent we don't know something. And that's terribly important in assessing risk. You don't just give economists a number. You give them a range that realistically reflects our uncertainty. And we're beginning to do that. The second point I want to make is a little bit more philosophical here, but I think it's important that there are other risks, such as the risk of global armed conflict, that are not easily quantifiable in economic terms. That is, when you think about risks in general, and especially about climate risks, it's tempting to think about only those risks that you can quantify. We're MIT, after all. That's what we do, and we should do it. But there are risks that you should seriously consider um, that aren't easy to put numbers on. 
you know, like global warfare, like massive disease outbreaks. We have to be cognizant of those risks, even if we can't put numbers to them. They may turn out to be the, the more important ones. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kerry. Question or two for Kerry. First. Uh, I read that since the major hurricanes in Florida was 10 years ago, after which they predicted that was just the beginning, there's been not been a, not been a category five since. Uh, is that true? How does that fit into the equation? So the question is that in the last 10 years or so, there have not been any high category hurricanes that actually hit the continental US, and that's absolutely true. Um, if there, had, there is a paper out on this that shows that that's absolutely in keeping with just plain old random variability. It's also a question of the metric. If you look at the damage in the United States done by hurricanes in the last 10 years, it's been colossal because of events like Sandy, which technically was not a major hurricane. The damage is the function of where we are. And it's where we are, right, absolutely. And, the, and if you include the Caribbean and Mexico, there's been essentially no decline in hurricane activity in the last 10 years. Well, also, you put in the typhoons, et cetera. That's an increase, isn't it? So um, when we look at the question is, if you put in typhoons, that is hurricanes in the rest of the planet, what's happened? The numbers of storms over the whole planet have been very stable. So the, our ability to count them goes back to about 1970, the dawn of the satellite era. <laughs> However, uh, some, there are some interesting trends like the ones I showed you about the drifting in the latitude. We don't do a very good job measuring hurricanes outside the Atlantic because we don't fly aircraft into them. But from what we understand from satellite data, some of the very most intense storms on record in the Western Pacific, the most intense storm on record was Haiyan just a few years ago. The most intense in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific was just a few months ago, Patricia. It's anecdotal, but that's what we expect to see more high category events. <laughs>